Hello and good morning, good afternoon or good evening, uh, depending on where you are. My name is Jim, Jim Pascoe, uh, and today we're going to talk about combining C++20 with Lua. So this is actually a major update of a talk that I gave at uh, CppCon 2020 last year. So if you've seen the CppCon talk, um, then don't worry, there's lots of uh, nice new juicy content. Uh, if you haven't seen the CppCon talk, then uh, don't worry, you'll get it all fresh for the first time. So. Uh, a few items to note. So here is the URL for the talk. Um, so if you want to follow along from the comfort of your own browser, uh, then please do so go here. Um, you can click the hamburger icon in the bottom left to navigate uh, around the presentation um, to change themes and stuff if you don't like the colors. Uh, the sample code that accompanies the presentation is here. Um, so pull that off my GitHub. Uh, and if you want to find out a little bit more about me and things that I've done and I'm interested in, um, then there's my email address and URL just there. Um, so we'll take questions as they arise. I think it's a bit more natural if they're sort of uh, done in line with the talk. Um, so please use the Q&A function. I've got another window here, so um, I should be able to see them as they pop up. Um, I think really, you know, questions like that, a bit more natural that way. Okay, so why are we here? What's this all about? Um, well, this is the goal. Really what I want to do is to provide a tutorial on combining C++20 and Lua 542. And I, I've been quite specific there with the versioning because really what I want to do is to provide some up-to-date practical advice with code. So if you've ever thought, uh, I'd really like to get into this kind of notion of uh, binding C++ and Lua together, um, but then you type it into Google and you end up with a sort of a bewildering a, a array of hits. Um, then really what I'm trying to do is to sort of short circuit all of that and give some insight and some direction to tell you, you know, kind of or offer you some advice on, on how you can actually do that for yourselves. Um, so like I said, there will be lots of code uh, and lots of examples. And it's, you know, the, the talk is of a very sort of practical nature. So we're going to look at why combine C++ and Lua. So why would you actually want to do this? Um, and as part of that, I'm going to introduce an example. So I think it's probably pretty clear to most people or most people sort of understand that uh, the combination of C++ and Lua is used quite widely in the games industry. Um, but the example we're going to look at today is an embedded example. It's related to high-speed transport, so specifically race cars and trains, um, vehicles that are moving at very high speeds. Uh, we're going to then get into all the juicy details of how to combine C++ and Lua. And as part of that, we're going to look at two technologies. So Sol3, uh, which is a, a C++ to Lua binding, and Swig, which is a sort of slightly different approach. Um, uh, but uh, Swig has a sort of a nice property in that you can generate bindings in lots of different languages from one set of sources. We're going to talk about benchmarking and concurrency. So how do you empirically reason about these systems? Um, and I'll give some advice on some experiments that you can run and things that you can look at uh, uh, to help, you know, sort of, uh, you, you know, so you can do your own literature studies and, and get into the field. Um, we're going to talk a bit about coroutines, um, uh, which are, you know, very important in Lua. And obviously we've got them now in C20. So how do they interact? How do they re uh, relate? Um, and we're going to look at performance as well. So we're going to start off, you know, sort of right at the high level on in terms of, you know, why you want to combine this. And then we're going to end up talking about kind of I caches, D caches, L2s, um, all that fun architectural stuff. So why combine C++ and Lua? Well, in a word, it's this, flexibility. Um, but really, it's more like this. It's about flexibility post-release. Um, and uh, in particular, what this means is that the behavior of the code can be modified after it's been shipped. And this is, this is actually uh, very powerful. It means that basically what you can do is you can cope with future unknowns. So um, uh, now I've emphasized uh, the word proactively here for a good reason. I mean, most companies or institutions where I've worked um, tend to sort of approach software development kind of there's a sort of a tacit methodology, if you like, where there's this sort of period of requirements gather. So you do that up front. Uh, then there's a sort of a period of, of kind of uh, architectural design or a design phase, um, coding, test, uh, and, you know, deployment, right? And then at that point, kind of the, the code gets handed over as a deliverable to a customer, it gets delivered, 
um, and that's kind of that's it. Then there's this sort of unwritten expectation that uh, the development team will kind of react or respond to bugs or feature requests or anything that sort of comes, you know, sort of comes later. Um, and while that's fine, basically what this technique allows you to do, it, a reason why it's um, why it's so powerful, is it, it flips that on its head, really, and it says, okay, rather than kind of wait till we're in the situation where we've deployed some code um, and then we've been, you know, we're kind of faced with uh, bugs or new feature requests or, you know, things that were previously unknown sort of hit us, um, we're going to say, all right, well, let's engineer some flexibility into our deliverable from word go. OK, so right from the start, we're going to end up there at some point six months in the future. So let's make sure that when we do arrive in that situation, that we have the flexibility in our software um, to be able to cope with those future unknowns uh, quickly and in an agile manner and in a way that's scalable as well. Yeah. So the nice thing about doing this, um, modifications are fast, right? So, it, you know, I've literally been sat in cars. Uh, editing Lua scripts uh, live, um, sat on trains editing Lua scripts live, and then you just you know close Vim, um, restart a system D daemon, uh, and your new code is running. Your new behavior is running, and that's very powerful. That's very useful because when you're in the field or if you're under pressure, then you, you need that agility. If you need to go through a whole kind of compilation, package, deployment cycle, um, it takes a lot longer, and uh, you can end up quickly being sort of overwhelmed. So one of the other nice things about Lua is that the barrier to entry is much lower. So for C++, obviously, um, everybody here and, you know, you guys are all, as far as I'm concerned, world-class programmers. Um, so, you know, we all love all of that kind of, you know, sort of TMP, spin A, uh, R value references kind of stuff and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I mean, it's literally, yeah, it's, you, you know, for us, this is great fun. Um, but for people like FAEs, architects and customers, um, that tends to be a bit of a, you know, sort of a barrier. Um, so what happens is basically, uh, it, it, you know, the software team end up being put under pressure to deliver even more code and even quicker. Yeah. So by using Lua, um, Lua has what I call a sort of tool appeal. Um, so people look at it and they immediately think, oh, yeah, OK, I can uh, understand this quite easily and I can uh, make my own changes. What you'll find is that actually FAEs, architects, customers, are much more likely to uh, work on it for themselves and to try things for themselves. Um, and then that gets fed back to the software team. So rather than uh, the kind of interactions being sort of, oh, there's a bug, software team, you need to fix this. What tends to happen now is kind of goes, oh, there's a bug. I had an email conversation with a customer. I tried all of these different things in Lua. I found this solution. Can you please consolidate it into, into a release software team? Um, so it's much more scalable, reduces the load on the software engineers, uh, and it's, um, you know, sort of better for everyone. Okay, so let's look at an example. So the example today is about high-speed transport. Um, uh, so by high-speed transport, I'm talking primarily about things like race cars and trains, um, but, you know, uh, but there are other examples of this as well. So, okay, Blue Wireless, right. Originally, uh, this was an IP licensing company, and this is a company I work for, by the way, um, which basically specialize in IP networking over 5G millimeter waves, so that's 60 gigahertz modems, so 60 gigahertz uh, unlicensed uh, spectrum communications. Um, uh, originally, Blue Wireless built uh, a Mac and a Fi um, from the ground up, and uh, I really do mean ground up, so, that, so sort of RTL, uh, you know, um, and, you know, kind of back-end hardening into um, uh, sort of TSMC type fabrication. Uh, and now it's basically sort of evolved into a product company. So what Blue Wireless does is to provide high bandwidth IP networking across long range wireless links. Um, and that's for a range of markets. So one of which is the high speed mobile, um, which is the trains and the race cars and stuff. And that's what I'm uh, basically responsible for. So it's important to note that by embedded, what I'm actually talking about is high-end uh, embedded systems. So um, we're talking about embedded quad-core ARM V8 MPUs. Uh, so these are, uh, you know, sort of units that are clocked at 1.2 gigahertz. They've got gigabytes of DDR uh, and they run, you know, sort of desktop Ubuntu Linux. Um, so they're not, you know, kind of small microcontrollers. I think, you know, um, in the past, people have tended to sort of hear the word embedded and, and think of, you know, kind of small micros and stuff. I mean, these are, you know, the, these units have the feel of a sort of desktop machine from kind of five years ago. 
So um, uh, basically the way it works is, uh, certainly for the trains, is we have a trackside component. Um, so we put radios along the trackside, and then we also mount radios on top of the trains um, as well. And then as the train is sort of proceeding down the track, it's making a sort of sequence of connections with the trackside radios and doing that in a, a you know, in a very controlled way. Um, and then that's providing this high bandwidth, low latency mobile internet connection. Yeah. Um, uh, so, okay, so here are the units. This is what they look like, if you were wondering. Uh, so the unit on the left, you can see these uh, PTFE windows here are, in fact, let me annotate. So these windows here, these are the radios. Um, this unit would sit on top of a train uh, uh, and then, um, these two here, this also. Uh, and then the in-train component, this bit would go uh, into the roof space of the train, uh, and this would connect to the train top unit via a PCIe link. Um, so the, uh, along the track side, of course, um, uh, you, you, as I say, as you're proceeding down the track, you're making this series of connections, uh, and then that's what's giving you your high bandwidth internet link. Okay, so now I've got a short video. Um, a 45 second video, which I'm going to play. There is audio, uh, so that's going to going to come out. But I think it sort of gets the kind of uh, the message across quite nicely. So we're going to look at that. How does it work? We mount our 5G millimeter wave nodes on existing infrastructure. Each one is installed at intervals between 400 meters and two. Okay, so this is the Millbrook Bowl. Uh, this is a racetrack just north of London. And as you can see, we've got it wired up with um, a number of radios that go around the track. And then we use this as a mechanism really for sort of testing the software. So we drive round and round in the bowl. And uh, basically what you can do is perform handover after handover after handover. Um, and uh, it, it works really well. It's quite a nice, uh, a nice sort of proving round. Two kilometers, depending on the type of terrain. This simple to deploy, cost effective approach. So you can see here the kind of the idea. Um, so we've got a one of the, the sort of top units mounted on the car, and that has uh, a rear connection and a forward connection, which obviously you can see. Um, and then that's obviously what's giving you your, your bandwidth. Approach then connects to passing high speed vehicles. Real time data can be processed at rates more. So what happened there was a handover. So the ideal of having two radios is that obviously you have a continuous connection uh, wherever you are. Um, so if anybody's worked in telecoms, you'll know that actually doing handover is really tricky and really complex. Um, but uh, uh, the, the way that we do it is actually we have a piece of software, the, the piece of software that we're gonna talk about, which is written in C++ 17 in Lua. And that's what uh, is giving you this kind of this beam choreography, this sort of sequence of connections and handovers and disconnections and stuff. So I should point out as well, these radios are spaced um, normally on a train track of about a kilometre apart from each other, uh, and that will that will give us a, a bandwidth of about three and a half gigabits per second. On 100 times faster than current 4G technology. For commuters, this ultra-fast connectivity means enhanced, productive and safer journeys. Providing connection speeds of up to three gigabits. So similar idea on the trains. Um, with the trains, obviously, you've got multiple radios. Uh, so typically, we would have uh, two of the train top units, um, or one at each end of the train. Uh, for very long trains, you might have more. And then what happens is inside, obviously, the NPU connects into the backbone Ethernet of the train. Uh, so typically via a 10 gig Ethernet connection. And then that connects in turn to a customer connection unit which is the basically the piece of hardware that you connect to when you step onto a train. So if you step onto a train and you, you, you scan for Wi-Fi, what you will pick up is a connection to the customer connection unit. And then the customer connection unit's job is to balance uh, that, that demand for internet connectivity across um, the available links. So across the available four radios. Gigabits per second will not only enable seamless connectivity for current applications, but will support a whole host of yet to be realized applications. Okay, all right. So that's, I think it's a good way of sort of uh, introducing the whole kind of thing. All right, so connection management. So I alluded to a piece of software um, that's doing the connection management. And this is, you know, absolutely crucial. This is mission critical. 
um, uh, it decides basically which radio to connect to and when. So as we're moving down a track, it makes the decisions about when to disconnect a link and when to connect to another one. And obviously the idol is to a, uh, make the handovers as fast as possible, so you know as low latency as possible, and B, um, to make sure that there's no interruption to connectivity. So we started off with a kind of a V1. Um, it had a very fixed behavior. Uh, what it would do basically is connect to the strongest signal. So it would just look around, do a scan, um, and it would say, okay, I can see an access point uh, with this strength, I'm gonna connect to that one. And then it would hold on for sort of, you know, for as long as it could, basically until the Mac told it it'd been disconnected and then it restarted. Now, um, I didn't write that piece of software. That was written in C++ 98. Uh, it was very monolithic. Um, but to or by all measures, it did a good job. There were very few bugs over its lifetime and um, basically it enabled the company to go from kind of like nothing to something, uh, if that makes sense. Um, but uh, if you've sort of watched this video and you've sort of thought, mm, I bet there are an awful lot of edge cases, um, you'd be right. Uh, I mean, working with RF is quite tricky and to uh, get good performance consistently across a range of weather conditions. So, you know, when it's snowing in the winter and when it's bright sunshine in the summer um, and, uh, you know, in an environment that's ever changing. So trees grow and block radios and things like that. Um, it's very difficult. I mean, it is very difficult. And what we found was this simplistic behavior uh, whilst, you know, being sort of intuitively, you know, the right thing to do um, didn't actually perform that well in the real world. The other thing was software updates were really costly because, like I said, it's a monolithic piece of C++ 98. Um, basically, whenever the customer would come to us and say, oh, we've got a new requirement or we want to do something different, uh, then I'd have to spend a week kind of unpicking this beautiful object-oriented hierarchy that had been uh, implemented, working out how to implement this cleanly in the design. Um, and then I'd put it all together and uh, then code it up test it, deploy it, and the whole thing would take like minimum going flat out like a week. Um, and then by which point the uh, customer typically would say, well, actually, sorry, we didn't really want this after all, or, <laughs> um, you know, we've got five other new requirements now. So it's pretty clear very quickly, very early on that we were going to have a real problem with scalability. We were not, we were not going to be able to, uh, you know, sort of maintain the level of output or turn the handle fast enough um, to meet the sort of customer requirements. So what do we do? Okay, well, like all good software, just did a complete redesign, um, and uh, we wrote a piece of software called Mobile Connection Manager, um, and basically this has a decoupled architecture. So this is C written in C plus plus seventeen uh, and uses Lua five four two, um, and the idea is it it's it splits the architecture into sort of two major components. So we have actions which are um, like capabilities. So, and they tend to be sort of named with verbs as their names. So uh, things like scan, connect, probe, measure, transmit, GPS, influx, database, you know, it's kind of that sort of thing. And these tend to be uh, sort of small uh, contained modules that are encapsulated and, you know, sort of written in C++ and designed, you know, sort of for performance. Then on top of that, we implement behaviors in Lua. And this is the, the code that is implementing the beam choreography. So this concept of when do we disconnect from an existing connection? When do we reconnect? When do we hand over? Um, how do we do that? What do we do if our connection drops and we're halfway between two posts? All of that kind of logic is implemented in a Lua. Um, and uh, what we do is actually we can say, uh, we take uh, one piece of Lua, so one behavior, basically per customer. So we have one behavior for the trains, one behavior for the race cars, one behavior for, um, you know, sort of fixed wireless access in urban environments. So changes can be made in the field by the FAEs, and that's very important because whereas before what was happening was we were getting a problem and then it was immediately software team, uh, there's a problem, fix this. Now the kind of interactions we're having is, uh, is uh, an FAE will, will say, okay, I've done, you know, I've had 20 emails with the customer. Uh, I've tried out various solutions. This one seems to work. It seems to satisfy um, their demands. Uh, can you just please put this into the code base? Yeah. Okay, great. So that means that the software team can operate with a cadence of kind of a, a monthly release cycle um, and the customer, you know, interaction is in the right place. 
Okay. So this is what the architecture looks like as a, as a picture. So like I said, we've got the Lua behavior on the top, and that really is the thing that the user kind of sees or interacts with. Um, the MCM main files are, so this is the kind of C++ glue that glues the whole application together. So this is where the main function is or the initialization happens here. Um, we've got logging support. We use speedy log, uh, which if you haven't seen it, is a, a brilliant library. Um, it's very good. Uh, it basically offers you a mechanism. So it gives you all the kind of conventional logging levels. So you can say, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, log trace, debug, warn, um, info, um, error, critical, fatal. Um, but it, it has amazing support for uh, different syncs as well. So you can send it to files, you can send the output to a console, you can have, you can only have, you can have like warn and uh, critical go to console. Um, uh, you can send it to journal CTL. I mean, it's it's really good and it's fast. Um, so highly recommend uh, having a look at that. I've got a link coming up for that in a minute. Um, uh, then we've got uh, a Swig Lua wrapper. So we'll get on to this uh, when we start talking about Swig. Uh, and that basically wraps the, that's the binding for the, the actions which is presented to the Lua. Um, and then we've got this actions library. So things like uh, scan, probe, connect, disconnect, timer, message. Um, so we need timers. We need blocking and non-blocking weights, uh, blocking weights uh, to prevent your CPU from going to 100%, which we'll cover in a minute. Um, uh, non-blocking weights because they're, they're just useful for timing events. Um, message is a, uh, a mechanism so where uh, one instance of MCM can communicate to another via TCP sockets. Um, that's all based on ASIO, uh, which again is a brilliant library. Um, so I'll show it. We'll have some examples of that later as well. Uh, and then scan, probe, connect, disconnect. These talk to a proprietary API, something called the Blue Wireless Connection Manager API, the CM API. And the idea of the CM API is to provide um, you know, sort of calls in user space that are, um, you know, sort of uh, much more palatable. So things like scan, probe, connect, disconnect, and then to do, to basically convert those into um, Netlink calls. So NL802.11 calls. So if anybody's ever looked at the NL802.11 uh, um, interface between uh, user space and kernel space, then it, it can be quite gnarly. Um, you know, it's it's very, very useful, very practical, but, you know, it's not really what I would say is sort of a, an API that you want to support with your users. Uh, that talks to the Hydra driver, um, which is a BH2, um, which is a blue wireless Linux driver. Uh, and that in turn talks, turns talk to the Mac, uh, which at the top layer of the Mac is basically firmware running on some embedded processors. And then that in turn drives the five through a, a sort of a hard, you know, sort of semi soft, you know, interface. Okay. All right. So let's actually get on to the juicy details of how to actually do this. So um, let's actually talk about some code and stuff. So Lua, what is it? Uh, well, Lua is Portuguese word for moon, uh, if you're wondering. Um, it's basically a lightweight embeddable scripting language, right? I mean, it's really beautiful. Um, if you've not come across it, I highly recommend you take a look at it, get it into your sort of programmer's toolbox. Um, it's dynamically typed, runs by interpreting bytecode. Uh, there's, it's very quick. Um, you can speed it up. There's a, a JIT engine for it as well. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's very fast. Has a lovely simple procedural syntax. Um, when you see it in a minute, you're, you're, you, you know, I think one of the nice things about Lua is that it, it has this kind of instant tool appeal. Uh, so you look at it and you think, wow, yeah, this is, this is what we need. This is kind of the answer. So. Um, you know, I think good technology tends to do that. I mean, if you remember, I don't know if you guys remember like the first time you saw Unix or things like that, but I remember the first time I saw uh, Slackware Linux when I was about 14 or something, I had an instant feeling of kind of, yep, that's the answer. That's what we need. Um, not quite sure what the problem is yet, but that's the answer. Uh, and similar technologies do that to me. So, um, you know, things like, you know, LaTeX maybe is another one. Uh, it has a glorious emphasis on meta mechanisms. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, Lua is very succinct, so there's no cruft. So it doesn't implement uh, mechanisms if you can build one from primitives that you already have. And um, a good example of that is that the main data structure in Lua is the table. Uh, so like a map, um, so you have key value pairs. And if you think about it, actually, you can derive pretty much any other data structure you want from that. If you want a vector, then uh, that's just a, a table where the keys are uh, integers, right? So indexes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 
Um, and uh, if you want to create a tree, that's just a table where the keys are maybe left or right. And um, and then you have other tables as the values, right? Uh, and so on. Um, so as I say, there's an emphasis on, on, on kind of meta mechanisms. It doesn't, you know, you it, it keeps it very small and succinct and that's great. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of instant appeal for architects, FAEs, um, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, kind of one of the nice things about using it in an embedded context is it's very small. It's, you know, only sort of literally a couple of hundred K when you compile it, even with the libraries. Um, and, you know, with a bit of, uh, it's very easy to make, to, to run out of cash, for example, and things like that. So you can get good performance. Um, it's not huge. Uh, and, you know, it's just very clear and, and easy to work with. All right. So Lua C API. Okay, so Lua communicates with C++ through a virtual stack. And that's absolutely true. Um, it, strict stack discipline is not enforced. So what I mean by that is that you can, you know, you can actually access the stack from the side if you like. So it's not just through the top, um, but that's okay. Indices from one, uh, well, positive indices are positions from the bottom. So it kind of counts up, goes one, two, three, four, five, N. Uh, whereas negative indices are relative to the top. So minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, minus N. Um, uh, there are some pseudo industries for the Lua registry, which is like a, a sort of a global place that you can kind of uh, stash things, if you like, uh, and up values, which are uh, a bit like static values for functions. So static variables and functions. Uh, here's a useful um, compilation flag and that will enable checks. So if you don't have that turned on, which is the default, and you've got something subtly wrong in your stack manipulation, then you won't know your, your code would just break. If you turn that on, then very often you'll get some indication of what's going on. Right, so let's look at an example then. So here's a piece of Lua, all right? Um, now this is a very simple piece of Lua. Uh, what we're gonna do is two things. So we're gonna create a table, uh, T, and obviously that's got two keys, X and Y, two values, one and two. Uh, and we're gonna declare a function, uh, oh well, in fact, and, and implement it. Um, so it's called f, we're going to take a, a string, a value, and an integer. I'm calling a library function uh, string.format, um, just so we can sort of pack it all into a nice kind of uh, one-liner. Um, uh, well, and also to demonstrate that such a thing exists. And then I'm going to call a C++ function, which we haven't seen yet. So I'm going to say, uh, declare a local variable, return code, and I'm going to um, call cpp func and pass it str uh, t.y and int. Yeah, so pretty simple. And I'm going to point out as well, I'm going to use this, this same piece of Lua for pretty much all of the examples. Um, and we'll see why that's kind of interesting in a minute. Okay, so here's the C++. All right, so what are we doing here? Well, first thing is, um, we've got this function that we saw in the previous slide, CPP func. Uh, I'm going to print, um, you know, a message. And also what I'm going to do is when I get into this function, I'm going to print out the contents of the stack. And I'm going to go, um, because these are positive integers, I'm going to go from the bottom of the stack and I'm going to work my way up. Um, so that means that I'm going to basically print out in the order of oldest to newest. Okay, what's this? All right, so this is some uh, kind of intro code that we always have in, in these, um, you know, to get things going. So we create a state. So um, Lua states are basically, um, you know, well, blobs of state that you pass around everywhere. Um, so if you look at the data structure actually in the, the Lua uh, code base, then you can see what it contains. But it's basically the execution state for the, um, uh, uh, for the system. We're going to open some libraries. Uh, I'm going to export my C++ function into the Lua space. So I'm going to actually um, introduce that as a global symbol into my Lua state. Uh, then I'm going to load a file of Lua. Uh, which I'm going to pass in the file name on the command line, and I'm going to call it as well. So I'm, I'm using this function here, Lua P call. Uh, the P stands for protected. Um, and what that means is I can pass, I'm choosing not to at this point, but I could pass a pointer to an error function here. Um, I'm going to say, run my code that's in, in my Lua state, which has been primed by this load file um, here. And I'm expecting to run it with zero arguments passed in. I'm expecting zero results from it. And as I say, I'm setting the uh, error function handling to null. All right, now, what that would do basically is in effect, uh, because the, the Lua file that we had, it didn't really do anything. It'll bring into scope two things. So the table uh, T and also the function F. 
So now we can manipulate those from our C++ code. So I'm going to go down here. Uh, and I want to basically say, I want to call the function f with the arguments how tx and 14. So I'm going to get the global reference to f. That's fine. And what that's going to do is it's going to push that onto the stack. So right at the bottom of my stack now will be a reference to f. Okay. Then I'm going to push a literal string onto the stack. So that's the second uh, entry. Then what I need to do in order to get the x value from t is I need to do this in two steps. So I need to, first of all, push t onto the stack. Okay. And then I'm going to ask for the field x as well. So that's going to go onto the stack. Right. And that will, that will result in the value x being taken off the stack and what actually the value of x is being put on it. So uh, the number one, basically. Now, because I've got to this point, I need to remove t from the stack. I've, already, I've still got t on my stack. Um, so I'm going to just slot it out from the side uh, and, and remove that and throw it away. Um, and then I'm going to push the number 14 onto the stack as well. Okay. So at this point, basically, I've got f how the value of tx, which is 1, and 14 on my stack. So now when I call lua call, I'm going to call f. I'm going to say there's three arguments. There's one result I'm expecting. Um, and then uh, that will actually call the function um, and you know uh, uh, and place the return value on the stack. Now I'm not doing anything with the return value at this point, um, but you could if you wanted to, you could inspect it, print it out, whatever. Um, you know, but uh, uh, that's a exercise for the reader. So uh, if we want to build and run all this, um, then on macOS, uh, it's actually quite straightforward. If you do brew install Lua, you'll get Lua 5.4, assuming you're sort of running on Big Sur. Um, uh, if you're running on things earlier than that, you might end up with Lua 5.3. It won't matter for this example. Um, if you are running on Ubuntu, uh, particularly Ubuntu 2010, so Groovy, um, you can use, there are packages for Lua 5.4. Um, I've got a reference to, I'll show you how to install the 5.3 packages uh, in a minute, uh, if you're using something earlier than that. Um, but I would also say, uh, you know, consider, you know, build Lua from source as well. I, I, I think it's very easy to build from source, get it from Lua.org. Um, you can build it in seconds. Uh, anything, any ANSI C compiler will build it, which is why it's so great for embedded. Um, but build it from source, because the, the beauty of doing that is that you can then, you know, sort of start grepping around in the source code and digging around in that, um, which is quite nice as well. So. Um, have a look at the, the Lua source, I would. Um, then uh, Clang compilation. So this is Apple Clang running here, again, on Big Sur. Um, and uh, uh, I'm passing in std C++ 2A. Um, uh, you, you could probably, uh, well, certainly um, C++ 17 would be enough, um, but it'll probably compile with previous versions as well. Um, and then uh, library Lua, obviously, and then uh, just a sort of a, a normal compilation. Then if you run the code, uh, pass in our Lua file, you get this, which is what we were expecting. So f function call with how 114, cpp function call with arguments how, oh, it was actually 214. Okay. All right. Um, oh, a question. Uh, yes, Costas. Um, uh, oh, wow. Well, okay. All right. <laughs> so you, you've, uh, you've sort of basically seen where I'm going with this, Costas. Um, yes, there is. Uh, so uh, when we get on to Sol, <laughs> um, then that's exactly that's exactly where I'm going going with this, um, Costas. But you're right. Um, so this it, is a very good point, actually. Uh, Costas has just made is if we go back to the code for a second and look at this. Um, this, you know, if you look at this, it it feels very fragile, very brittle. Uh, you've got you know a lot of kind of like magic numbers popping up and you know zeros and all sorts of things and. Um, just for, for the moment, if we look, uh, just bear in mind, this is what, line 13. So this is 25 lines of code. Um, so imagine that you had, you know, sort of files and files and files of this, right? Um, it would be, yeah, as I say, brittle, fragile, you know, virtually impossible to maintain. Um, uh, so, and I, I don't think, I think that the way that uh, Lua CAPI has been written, really, it's about... It, I, I don't think really people are, are really expected to use it directly as such. I mean, you can do, obviously, and, you know, certainly you might want to if you really want to squeeze every ounce of performance out. But, um, but yeah, we're going to look at some alternatives to this. Okay. So let's move on. All right. So, okay. So as Costas was saying, basically, 
um, what we need here is some abstraction. Uh, and the first one we're going to look at is Sol3. So this is a great piece of code. Uh, this is for binding modern C++ to Lua. Um, and I've certainly uh, found it to be very useful. So a uh, bit of a history lesson. Back in the, in the beginning, Sol was invented by uh, Danny Ratz. Um, and then basically what happened was around about 2013-ish, uh, I suspect kind of, um, you know, in, in line with C++11, uh, um, Sol, uh, the maintainership moved to, to Jean-Hid Menid, who many of you will know. Uh, he's very active in the C++ community and he goes by the moniker, the PhD. Um, and Sol2 came out of that, which is uh, a very good piece of code. And then more recently, uh, Sol3 has arrived. And uh, the, the way to think of Sol3 is because um, I still see a lot of references to Sol2 around. It's basically Sol2 uh, version 3. So Sol2 was after sort of quite a big rewrite. And then um, Sol2 version 3 is kind of being uh, referred to as Sol3. So there's a really nice community there. There's like 100 plus contributors. Um, it's really good piece of code. Uh, and I'd say these guys are really kind of like up with modern C++ and stuff, um, which is just great. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's a very good choice, very good place to start, I would say. Um, it's a modern C++ binding for Lua. So if basically your project is C++ and you want to connect it to Lua and it always will be C++, then um, seriously, have a look at Sol3. So uh, let's get going, get, get going with some examples. So it's header only. Uh, it's very fast. If you click the link, um, um, by the way, these are you know these are all links. Um, if you click the link, uh, you can go and see the benchmark uh, report for uh, Sol three, um, and also uh, John he you know he he makes his code uh, available so others people can do some benchmarking, which we'll cover cover later as well. Um, it's very quick, uh, and also it's uh, you know it's very easy to sort of get going with it. Good support for modern C++ types. So it's got things like, you know, sort of good support for like callables, um, user-defined types, um, uh, uh, resource counted types, you know, good support for containerization, um, lots of customization points. Uh, it's really well thought out. You know, it's really nice piece of code. And one of the, the really cool things about Sol um, that I like is that it has a really nice upgrade path. Um, so uh, what I mean by that is if you have got a lot of code um, that pre-exists, or if you do want to actually intermix Sol with other technologies, then it, it does work quite well with that. So if you do find that, oh, actually for this small piece of code, I'm gonna, you know, just tweak the, I'm gonna actually use the Lua C API um, because I really want to make this as fast as possible, um, then you can, and that coexists, you know, seamlessly with Sol. So let's see some examples. All right, let's go back to our stack manipulation example. So what we just looked at, um, with the Lua C API, and let's rewrite it in terms of Sol. So, uh, okay, all right, here's the main function. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I immediately feel better when I look at this. Um, so immediately we've reduced this to a 15 line function. Uh, so we've taken 10 lines off of the code. Um, we've got some, uh, some, well, we create some state, uh, we open some libraries. Um, oops. Uh, we create some state, we open some libraries. I'm using the base libraries and string, because uh, remember in my piece of Lua, I call string.format. Um, and then I'm going to export a function into the Lua space. And it's as simple as just saying this. I'm going to say, create me a global symbol called CPP func and assign it to CPP func, which is up here. Uh, I'm going to load, load the script and run it. So do that in one, one go. Um, and then I'm going to call F with the arguments how TX and 14. So I can say, Give me uh, a, call, a reference to this callable. It's in Lua called F. Thank you very much. Uh, and then just call it. I like that. Right. So instantly, that's much better. Um, okay. Here's our CPP fun function. So you'll notice that I've left this exactly the same as in the previous example. So you can see I'm, I'm talking about Lua state here. I'm calling the CAPI functions again. Uh, Lua get top, get string. It's exactly the same as it was before. And the other thing is, I haven't changed the Lua at all. Uh, you know, all, all I've done is I've just introduced Sol and I've just changed the main function. Uh, I've just tidied up that main function. Okay, and then we can go one step further. So we can we can run that, we can test it, we can verify that the output is what we expect. We can run our unit tests. And then we can say, well, actually, I do want to, to update this code here. I'm going to now, instead of having this, um, you know, this Lua state and using the Lua C API, I'm going to uh, 
bring this up in terms of C++. So now I'm talking about standard string and in A in B, and then I'm just going to print it all out on one line. Yeah, and again, um, if you, uh, oh, yeah, and then uh, you can register this again um, into the Lewis space just by basically just changing the name of the uh, the function that you're assigning to CPP func here. So again, I haven't touched the Lua. I haven't changed the Lua at all at this point. So here's how you build and run it. Um, again, if you need to brew install Lua, you can do that or um, go and get the packages. Uh, it's a simple Git clone for to grab Sol2 and then a simple compilation. So clang, um, again, this is Apple clang. Uh, so I'm running my code and then I get the output that I had previously. If I run the one line version, uh, then um, I get the output that I'm expecting now. So it's all on one line. Yeah. So as I say, that's kind of one aspect of when I say nice upgrade path. I mean, that's kind of one aspect of it. But there are other features in Sol as well, which we'll see in a moment, um, uh, that make upgrading your code really, really easy and really nice. Uh, All right, let's have a slightly more complex example. So let's let's talk about a containerized uh, example. Um, and let's say uh, that we have a requirement where we want to have a container of messages. And by messages, what I mean are, you know, kind of ASCII strings. So human readable text that, um, so people are, you know, kind of IMing each other and they're saying, you know, hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. Are you enjoying Aku? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, those kind of things, all right? Um, but let's say that uh, we want to make this sort of slightly more complex. We want to timestamp these messages. So their arrival, we want to timestamp them with something that's human readable, but at the same time, um, second resolution is probably not good enough, yeah? Because if we get two messages arrived within the same second, which is perfectly feasible, we won't be able to, to tell which one has arrived first. So um, we want sort of time stamps, but we want something with a bit more granularity. Um, so let's go for microsecond resolution. All right, so how are we gonna do all of this with Sol and Lua, right? Okay, so, um, and by the way, I should point out, all of these uh, examples are designed to be cut and paste from the slides. So if you if you just, you know, grab the code off the slide, um, you know, cut and paste it into your editor window, uh, and then compile it with the flags and stuff. I mean, you should be able to get this going in sort of matter of kind of five minutes, really. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to use uh, Howard Finance um, superb date library with this, uh, you know, really because I want to use the HHMMSS class uh, as a template class. Um, uh, and if you haven't looked at Howard's date library, uh, which sits on top of Stud Chrono, I mean, it's brilliant. Um, that, again, that's well worth, uh, well worth looking at. Uh, highly recommend that. So we're going to use that. All right, and then we're going to start off. So we've got a class. Uh, we've got some usual kind of um, type aliases. So I've got a std pair to say, uh, to describe timestamp message. It's going to be two strings. And, and then I've got a vector of them, basically. And then I declare um, a vector of messages. OK. Then I've got this signature here. Um, so uh, this is all kind of, again, sort of fairly idiomatic C++. So value type, iteration size type. Um, I'm declaring a begin end size and empty. So all things that, you know, pretty much we'd all recognize uh, as being sort of idiomatic C++. And now what this does though is uh, Sol will, when it sees this signature in a, a user defined type is that it will treat this uh, as a container now. Um, and what that means is what Sol does under the covers is it sets up all sorts of uh, useful meta tabling in Lua so that all of the kind of the conventional Lua idioms for manipulating containers just work. Um, so things like, you know, sort of uh, iterating across a container using pairs or printing it as a table or tables and things like that. Um, so that all just works. Okay. You can turn it off if there are problems. And there's lots of really good documentation and examples on the Sol website. So um, highly, highly recommend that. Okay. Here's our member function add message. All right. This is what we're going to be calling. So we're passing in a string. Uh, we're using chrono. Uh, I'm going to use the system clock to get a, a time um, a time point now. Uh, and then basically what I want to do is I'm going to create, I, I need to get the time for midnight because I want to call HHMMSS down here like this, now minus midnight. Um, so the way I'm going to do that basically is I'm going to create a copy in now t, time t. I'm going to zero out the time. So that's leaving all of the kind of the date and all of that stuff 
uh, untouched. So that's basically given me kind of now at midnight, if you see what I mean. Uh, and then I'm going to pass that as a duration. Well, I'm going to convert it back to a, a time point and I'm going to pass it as a duration. So I'm going to say now minus midnight into HHMMSS and um, you know export that into via an O string stream. Yeah. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to push um, uh, push that into my vector to create my timestamped message. Okay, great. All right. How do we test this? All right. Well, we can do this. Um, so in the main function, I'm going to create a Lua state. Uh, I'm going to open some libraries, the base libraries. And I'm going to register my new user type. So like I said, this is setting up all of the kind of nice meta tabling and all of that um, interesting stuff. Uh, so here's my type, timestamp messages. I'm going to export it as uh, into the Lua space as timestamp messages. And I'm also going to register this uh, member function as well. I'm going to say add message um, is actually uh, and, and give a, uh, an address uh, to it here. Then one of the really cool things about Sol is you can, you know, uh, you can embed bits of Lua code via raw string literals into, into the main flow of the C++. So now I'm going to say, OK, run me a script in Lua. Um, we've got a raw string literal. Uh, and I'm going to say timestamp messages um, to create a new one. So timestamp messages.new. So when I, uh, when I execute new user type, that's uh, Sol sets up a new function for me. Um, then I can uh, add messages like this, so one, two, three, and then I can just iterate over them as I would any other table of pairs in Lua, and I can say, all right, so uh, for, um, so I'm going to use the scratch variable because because this is a vector, the keys are uh, numerical indices, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm not actually, you know, I'm not interested in really printing those, but obviously you can if you want to see what it looks like. Um, what I want is to extract the timestamp and the message, uh, and then I'm just going to iterate over the vector, and I'm going to print them out. Yeah, that's fine. And then back in C++ land, I'm going to do the same thing. Um, I'm going to say timestamp messages. Uh, so I'm going to uh, get it from Lua uh, and assign it to a reference here. And then I'm going to use a structured binding and just iterate uh, in my range-based for loop over, over the whole vector um, and just print them out. OK, and if you run that, uh, you get this. Um, so that's where to get Howard's library from. That's obviously sold too. Uh, so another simple compilation. Uh, and then you can see in Lua space, I'm getting this. And in C++ space, I'm getting the same thing. And you can see that my timestamps are, it was good that actually we went down to uh, microsecond resolution, because otherwise, if we'd only, only gone to millisecond resolution, then I still wouldn't have been able to distinguish between these two messages. To see which one it arrived first, so um, so that's 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 a bit of fun. Okay, so um, any questions at that point? Uh, no, uh, looks okay. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about a slightly different technology. So, like I said, um, what's nice about Soul is that it's C plus plus, and if your application is C plus plus and always going to be C plus plus. Um, then I sort of uh, highly recommend you look at Sol. Um, uh, we're going to talk about Swig, and Swig has one very kind of compelling advantage in that you can generate bindings from one set of sources for lots of different languages. So if you say, well, okay, my main application is in C++, um, but actually my system test bench is in Python, so I'd really like a set of Python bindings for my actions as well. Well, you know, Swig can do that in a sort of the same flow. Um, I mean, obviously you could do that with Sol, but you'd need another technology as well. Um, or, you know, if you say, oh, now my customer is starting to use Go, I'd really like a set of Go bindings, um, you know, then uh, you, Swig will do that as well. So in fact, I think Swig has something like about 12 languages that it targets. Um, so from one set of C++ sources, you can uh, generate, you know, bindings for up to 12 things. Okay. So what is it? Um, simplified wrapper and interface generator. So uh, produces C++ bindings for many target languages. And it, it's like a, a kind of like meta, you know, meta, uh, well, I don't want to use the word compiler, but, um, you know, it's one of these tools. It will scan your C++ source, uh, and then it will produce, as I say, bindings in various target languages. It generates a Lua stack calls for standard C++ types. So you don't have to worry about things like std string, std vector, std map, et cetera. All of, all of that kind of stuff just works. And I would say uh, the C++ support in Swig is very good. 
it's probably not quite as up to date as um, Soul3, but as I say, you know, the Soul3 community are very uh, passionate about, you know, kind of uh, modern C++. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, Swig supports C++17, uh, and it does so pretty well, and we're using it in production systems. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's it's good, solid, you know, wonderful piece of code. Uh, so C++ 20 types, you know, can be supported with type maps. And we'll go through some examples of that in a minute. Um, you know, uh, that's quite interesting. But what SWIG gives you is a huge amount of flexibility and power over how bindings are created, right? And really, that's, you know, that's kind of its strength. The fact that you can produce these bindings in lots of different languages and you get a lot of, a lot of flexibility and a lot of power in terms of um, how that's done. So integrates well with CMake. So sometimes, you know, um, having like these kind of like tools uh, that sit alongside the compilation flow, they don't often, don't always sort of integrate with the build flow particularly well. Um, but Swig works with CMake brilliantly. Uh, you know, I mean, it's absolutely seamless. So it's, you, you know, there's no, there's no issue there. All right, Lua chat. So what is this? Okay. Um, so what I've done basically is, um, uh, well, a while ago, Jason Turner, who was at uh, ACU 20, 2019, he published a sort of C++ starter project on, on his, um, uh, I think it was on his GitHub. Um, and it was very popular. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll do something similar uh, with C++ in Lua. Um, so what I've done is to sort of create a starter application called Lua Chat, uh, which you can obviously claim from my GitHub in, and use that as a sort of a basis to sort of get you, get you kind of going with, um, you know, if you wanted to sort of use Swig and Lua and C++ all together, um, then you can take that and use that as a starting point or, you know, um, and it's MIT licensed. So, you know, you can obviously do what you like with it. Uh, if you make some money, you know, well done. Um, it's good for you. Uh, okay, it uses ASIO for asynchronous TCP and timers. Um, and that's the other thing as well, is that uh, I went for, for sort of asynchronous TCP connections uh, because it makes the example a little bit more interesting. So, you know, it's quite hard when you're sort of picking examples. It's got to be simple enough to uh, get your point across and for people to be able to access it without a huge learning curve. But you don't want to be in the position where you've uh, exhausted the example completely, you know, sort of 10 minutes later. So, as uh, so we will see some examples of, of ASIO. So, if you've been thinking, or oh, I'd really like to see an example of how to use ASIO, ASIO to do TCP communications, then have a look at this as well. Uh, speedy log for logging, which I've said is a great piece of code. It uses the uh, FMT library, which is great. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I can't wait for that to sort of land in, in lib C++. Um, uh, very nice piece of code. Um, go and have a look at it. CXX, CXX ops for command line processing, also very good. Um, and CMake for the build generation. All right, so if you run it, um, this is kind of what it looks like. So it's a bit old school. Um, uh, in uh, basically what it does is a, it's a, a kind of a chat program. So you can talk to people on remote servers and uh, have conversations. Um, this is me running it on uh, my laptop. Um, so it gives you an example of how you would run it on, you, you know, two instances on the same machine and you can sort of talk to each other. Um, but obviously, you know, if you're talking to somebody on a remote machine, then you don't need to specify ports and all of that sort of thing. So, um, so uh, that's what it looks like when you run it. Here's the architecture. Um, so this again looks very deliberately like the MCM architecture. And uh, what, what I'm trying to do is really sort of bring into this, uh, you, you know, the kind of the, the concept of a sort of an action and a behavior. Um, so uh, obviously we've got the behavior at the top. That's the Lua that you can edit and you can change the behavior of the file. Uh, and in fact, you can do that whilst, you know, pretty much whilst online with somebody. So you can be chatting to somebody, control C, Vim your code. Uh, and then up arrow, up arrow, hit enter and reconnect and, um, or, you know, start using the new behavior. Got the main files, which is where you'll find all of the initialization in main. Uh, we've got the Lua wrapper, which is generated by Swig, and that's wrapping three actions, log, timer, and talk, which we'll go through. Um, log is there basically to wrap the speedy log primitives because uh, I want my Lua logging to go through speedy log. I don't want it to come out somewhere else. Uh, timer and talk obviously are based on ASIO. Um, and then that's obviously talking to the kernel. All right, here's the CMake. Um, so when I said it was simple, uh, it fits onto one slide. Uh, and this, this genuinely is all of it. Um, you can see here, this is this .i file. This is the uh, Swig input file, which we'll go through um, in, in a minute. 
uh, and that has its kind of own library, uh, uh, own language and stuff. But once you get into it, it's quite straightforward. This is where you specify the language. So I could just as easily change this to Python um, and I'd get a set of Python bindings. Um, it's, you know, you probably would need a slightly different one of these, um, but, uh, you know, you, you kind of, you get the idea. Okay, so this is a, a Lua chat swig input file. Um, what you do is you declare a module. Uh, so we're going to call it actions. And this is the name by which you will refer to um, the, the code that you're wrapping from the target language, which in this case is Lua. I'm going to include the such string definitions. Like I said, uh, Swig has uh, good support for all of the sort of, you know, kind of key standard types, which is quite nice. Um, uh, you know, so you don't need to worry about those. Uh, and then because basically what's happening is Swig is producing a wrapper, which is a piece of C++ code, um, any definitions that we need to allow that wrapper to compile go in these uh, percent brace block here. And that tends to get inserted into the file at the top of the file. So, you know, typically, you know, hash includes things like that. Okay, and then we get to the um, bit about, okay, the files to be wrapped by Swig. I tend to, to a dollar include the logging facilities first. And the reason for that is so that I can include them in things like this. Now, um, uh, just as, you know, kind of uh, what, what I do in Lua chat is I throw, throw um, exceptions only from constructors. Uh, so this piece of code is basically going to wrap my uh, constructors with a try catch block so that I can scoop up any exceptions and I can pass them to log fatal, which will then send them out via speedy log and not, you know, I won't get the, the, the default kind of stood terminate was called thing. If we go down here, now we actually include the actions and define some exception handlers. So uh, obviously we've got, we've included the logging action. We've got the talk action, the timer action. We're gonna wrap the constructors uh, on these lines. So what these lines do is they apply this macro. And then I'm gonna actually include the file here and that will um, signal to Swig to scan it uh, and to generate binding calls for any of the types that I reference within it. Uh, and what you wanna do really is you wanna set this up. So adding this is quite easy. So it's quite easy to add actions. Literally, if I want to extend the number of actions, I can write a piece of C++ and then I jump into this file and I just, I, uh, I add, you know, I cut and paste these two lines um, and then, hey presto, I've got a new action in my, uh, available to my Lua code. Type maps, okay. So this is, um, this is where we get a bit more, uh, there's a bit more complexity here. Right, so map C++ types onto types in the target language. Like I said, target language in this case is Lua. Um, so we can add support for modern C++ abstractions. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through an example where uh, I'm gonna add a facility for adding callbacks. So what I mean by that is, is that I want to be able to, in, in my Lua function, pass a Lua function to a std function in C++ land, yeah? So I don't want basically anything kind of, you know, sort of funny going on. In, in the C++ code, I want to refer to um, functions that are in the Lua space via std function and to use all of the kind of the usual uh, callable abstractions that we've got available. So a quick acknowledgement to Peter. Um, he gave me the original version of the following example, and then I've obviously heavily modified it. So here's a type map. Okay, now on first uh, first time you encounter this, um, there's a lot of uh, complexity. It looks a bit confusing, but actually, when you spend ten minutes looking at it, um, you you well, you know, you, once you've got into it a little bit, um, then uh, it gets much easier. I would point out as well that if you go to this link, there's a, a gist on my GitHub um, where all of these files you can download the whole shooting match, and uh, you know you can get the whole example and try it for yourself. Okay, so let's go through this. All right, so the first bit is a type check type map. All right, um, and what this does basically is it's here uh, to verify that something that matches what uh, Swig terms is a pattern, and this is a pattern, right? So it's a type in C++. Uh, so every time that pattern is matched, um, then this type check function, this type check type map will be invoked. Now, if you go and look at the GitHub gist, um, you'll find that actually this uh, this example code on code on callback is actually just a uh, an alias. So it just says using um, uh, it's a using uh, type alias to std function uh, void open paren void close paren. Um, so it's a std function to 
a, a function that takes no parameters and returns no return values. Okay. So every time we 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 are targeting one of these, yeah. So a std function void void. Um, or we're going to run this type check. And what we're going to do is we're going to check that the thing that is being referenced in Lua land um, is a function. And if it's not a function, we print a nice error message. So if the user tries to pass in you know, a string or something like that, then we'll get a nice error message and it won't just um, break hideously. OK. Then this is the actual type map. All right. So, Type maps have this concept of direction. So in means that we are going into C++. If, we're, if our type map was going out, um, we would be going out into the target language, if that makes sense. Um, and again, we're matching this pattern. So anytime we are calling from Lua into C++ and we are matching a, the pattern associated with this type, so std function uh, void void ref, um, then this type map will be, uh, will be used. Now, uh, this here that looks a bit like um, uh, a function argument uh, is actually saying, in the swig wrapper where you insert this code, um, please create me a temporary variable of this type. Um, so if you look at, if you run this code through swig, and then if you look at the swig wrapper it generates, um, you will see that uh, around about the point where we have this piece of code, uh, there's a, a temporary variable called temp declared of that type. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a reference to the Lua callback. Um, so this is a feature that uh, Swig provides. Um, this is a way, basically, of creating a reference to a function that persists across calls to the Lua interpreter. All right. So there's a lot to digest then in that statement. But if you look at the documentation, then it will become a bit clearer. Um, effectively, this is a way of saying, you know, uh, stash a pointer to a function somewhere where we can get it back later. So we're going to set up our reference. Um, it's like this. So FNL, uh, we've got uh, our dollar input. So dollar input basically is um, uh, that's the thing that we're referring to in Lua land. So that's what's being passed into the function, if you like. Um, and then we're going to create a lambda. So we're going to create that with our temp here. And we're going to capture FN. Uh, and we're going to say, retrieve our reference, that's it, which is here. And we're going to call it with Lua protected call. And again, because we know it's a void void function, we know that it has zero arguments, uh, zero return values, and we don't want a, um, uh, we're not gonna use a uh, an error checking function. Okay, and then we take our uh, Lambda and um, we assign it to the thing we are targeting in C++ land. So, um, you know, the instance of uh, std function void void in C++, it's going to call that lambda um, when we want to call our callback. All right. And just a little tip um, uh, dollar, I'm going to present include the source files after the type map declaration. So you need to do that after the type map declaration. So it's quite idiomatic to sort of dollar include all of your source files at the top of the top of the file, and then you write the type maps. But Swig doesn't know um, about the type maps uh, at that point when it's scanned through your. Um, include files. So in, include the source files after you've declared your type maps. Okay. All right. So, so there's a lot of a lot to sort of digest there. But if you look at the documents, um, and if you you know, of course, if you have any problems, uh, mail me, and also you know, have a look at my GitHub gist uh, where you can download all of this stuff and there's build instructions, um, and you can get it running. So I'm going to turn on some lights. I think it's just suddenly got really dark in here. Uh, all right, that's a bit better, I suppose. Okay, actions. So let's go through the actions. So we started talking about, um, so we've got three of them. Talk, which is going to send messages to a remote Lua chat. Um, that's based on ASIO. Uh, the talk action also has to act as a server. So what we don't really want is to have an action um, that allows us to communicate out, but then we have to have a separate action to act as a server. So really, we want to tie them both together into you know one piece of code. We're going to use TCP for fault tolerant in order delivery. Um, so we do care if messages get lost. Uh, we do care about the ordering. Um, so we want TCP semantics for that. Uh, and I'm going to use one asynchronous TCP connection per message. I mean, you could obviously just open a TCP connection to the remote end and then use that to send your traffic backwards and forwards. Um, I'm not going to do that because, as I say, it makes the example a bit more interesting uh, if you have one asynchronous TCP connection. 
Um, reason being is that brings in the concept of um, lifetime management for the buffers and the sockets and all of that, which, you know, if you've, if you've ever done sort of asynchronous comms, um, that is kind of, you know, that is really the tricky bit. Timer uh, is there to implement blocking and non-blocking weights. Um, so we need a blocking weight uh, primarily for the dispatcher, which we'll see later. Uh, and non-blocking weights are obviously quite useful um, in the code occasionally. Um, uh, so uh, they're there for waiting for timed events. Again, using ASIO, um, uh, which is, you know, we'll, we'll go through in a moment. And the log action is just there to sort of wrap the speedy log primitives. So it's quite lightweight. So if you go and check out Lua chat, then you, you'll see, basically, it's quite straightforward. All right. So um, TCP connections. So how do we do this with ASIO then? Right. Um, actually, if you go and look at the ASIO documentation, so here's a link uh, for, um, you know, sort of TCP. Uh, it has this kind of model, and um, I find it's to, this to work really well. Um, as I say, it's about lifetime management and when you close sockets and all of that. So, um, uh, so let's go through it. Okay, so we've got this class. I'm going to create a pointer, a stitched pointer to itself. Um, it's pretty obvious. And uh, the reason we're using shared pointers is because I want to have multiple pointers pointing at the same connections. Um, I'm going to have this factory function, this static factory function, this create, um, where we're going to pass in an I.O. context. Now, an I.O. context in, in terms of ASIO is like an executor. Um, it's just there. Basically, it's the, the, if you like, the active component that's sort of doing the um, event monitoring and actually doing the, the work. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to return from this function a pointer, um, so new TCP connection, I.O. context. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got this private uh, constructor down here, um, which is just passing the IO context into the socket. Uh, then we've got some getters uh, and some data. So uh, you'll notice I'm passing back mutable references. Um, the reason for that is because I want to have TCP connections for data both going out and arriving. So I don't really want to have two data structures, um, you know, sort of based on direction, I want it to be able to, you know, model data going out uh, and data that's coming in, basically. Okay, then connection handling, how do we do it? Well, in the talk action, so we've got a constructor, uh, which is this, this one up here. Um, and what this is saying basically is given a port number, I'm going to create an acceptor, which is like a, a sort of a mechanism for accepting connections. Um, TCP endpoint, uh, I'm going to use IPv4. Uh, for simplicity, uh, here's my port number. And then I'm going to, um, before I do anything, I'm going to allocate some work to it. So I'm going to um, put uh, some work onto my executor. And the reason for that is because if I start my executor, my IO context running immediately with no work on it, it will immediately say, I've run out of things to do, and it will exit. Yeah, so you need to load it up before you start it running. Um, so I'm going to call this function start accept. Uh, so we're going to create a TCP connection. I'm kind of passing through the port information that I want to bind to via this kind of M acceptor get executor, which is getting back to my IO context call. Um, so I'm going to create a TCP connection here, and then I'm going to uh, fire off an asynchronous accept. Okay, so this, this function is going to return immediately. Um, I'm giving it the socket that I'm interested in, uh, which will be uh, bound to the port that I've passed in up here. Um, and also, and then I'm saying call this lambda at some point in the future when you've accepted a connection. Uh, and the reason for the Lambda really is to pass down uh, my TCP connection, so this connection object here. Uh, and then when a, when a connection actually arrives, I'm going to call another function called handle accept. Okay. Um, so by doing this, by having this kind of like, you know, this Lambda here, I'm prolonging the lifetime of my TCP connection. So I'm saying this is still in scope. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to start my IO context running. So off we go at this point, we're up and running. OK, so we get a connection. Uh, we actually have a connection. And the real kind of meat of it really is this, this call to async read. So I'm going to say, OK, great. Well, we've accepted a message connection. Um, I'm going to schedule an asynchronous read. I'm going to do so on this socket, which is obviously passed me by the connection. And then I'm going to uh, give ASIO a pointer to the buffer. Uh, it has to be a dynamic buffer, which basically means that it's not a um, it's not a static buffer. It can it can change size, um, uh, and I'm going to give it a mutable reference to my std string, which is embedded in my data. 
And then I'm going to pass down again another lambda. So I'm going to say, in the future, when you've read something from this or you've had an error, um, uh, then please call this function, handle read. So error, number of bytes transferred, and the connection. So again, I'm, I'm maintaining the lifetime of my TCP connection. So that's keeping that in scope. And then before I exit from this function, I'm going to call start accept again to spin it up for the next time. Because again, if I just uh, return from this function, then my executor will say, that's it, I'm all done. And you know, it's, uh, um, it will quit. The thread will, will terminate. OK, so at some point in the future, uh, hopefully we read some data. Um, first thing we do is check for error. So either we've got no error, or the other end has disconnected. That's OK. Um, that's almost certainly going to happen because we're sh sending sort of short, uh, very rapid messages. So if I send the message, hello, um, then there's a very good chance that that connection has been closed by the other end uh, before, you know, this, uh, this function has been invoked. It's absolutely fine. Um, I've got some code just to stop the message array from getting too big. Uh, and then I'm going to extract the data, which is my string, and um, put it into the back of the message queue. Uh, and then print some log messages. So I'm going to say log info, we've received a message, or print out an error. Okay. All right, and then this function is what we're going to use in Lua um, to retrieve the message. So we're going to say get next message. If nothing's available, return an empty string. So do nothing. Otherwise, pop one off the front and return it. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the Lua code. So let's look at the behavior. Coroutines. All right. I absolutely love coroutines. Coroutines are brilliant. Um, they're great for event-driven asynchronous systems. Um, Lua coroutines are stackful, uh, and uh, that makes good sense because in Lua, uh, coroutines really are kind of used as a sort of proxy for threads. Um, so uh, I think, um, you know, so having them stackful means that they have a, a complete, you know, sort of execution stack. Um, and uh, that's useful because it means you can suspend and resume them from anywhere in the, the execution. So even from things like libraries um, and stuff like that. And, you, you know, as I say, they're being used really as a sort of proxy for threading um, in, in some sense of the word. So you want those, you know, those kind of uh, those facilities. Um, there is a cost, obviously, with Statful coroutines uh, in that they don't scale enormously. Um, but as I say, in, in terms of sort of the lure space, um, you know, if you're using them really as kind of like threads or, you know, sort of lightweight threads, fibers, in fact, um, then, you know, you, you want that. Uh, you, you want to be able to suspend and execute them from anywhere. T plus plus 20 coroutines are stackless, like in JavaScript. Um, this is really good. Uh, it means you can, they scale. Uh, you can have millions, if not billions of um, uh, coroutines on uh, a, a server, for example. Um, and that's, you know, that's extraordinarily powerful. Um, uh, I would say as well, if you're, uh, just as a sort of an aside, a sort of slight digression, if you're kind of at the point where you're still trying to sort of understand coroutines or, or to look at what they do or how they work, um, have a look at one source of information to have a look at is Gore Nishinov's uh, WG21 papers. So particularly if you go back a bit, go back to sort of about 2014, uh, when all of these kind of statful, statless um, stateful, stateless, stateful, stateless terms were being uh, really kind of um, hammered out in the, the literature, um, and well, and really kind of you know sort of uh, you know people were really educating themselves on those kind of concepts. That that is that is for me um, about the best source of information I found on coverage. And then work forward. Yeah, there's some good CPP con talks as well. James McNellis did a good one in 2016. Um, but you know, sort of you know, I, I'd start with the those papers from Gore and Ishinov and, and work forward. Okay, so, um, all right, so this is very important. Okay, so coroutines are great. If you're if you're looking at a thread body and you're thinking, um, mm, I've got an operation there, which I know is gonna take a very long time, uh, but it's not blocking as such, but I know it's gonna take a long time. Um, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could just jump down here into my in my thread body and do this piece of work because this would actually be useful work. If you're thinking that, right, then, you know, coroutines are what, what you want or, you know, sort of one approach to do to doing that. Because um, what you have in, in Lua is you have a sort of a coroutine universe, uh, so multiple coroutines which run in the context of a single thread. And this is all lock-free. There are no races. There are no synchronization primitives. But what it allows you to do, as I say, is, is to, if you know that something is going to potentially take a long time, 
and that's not sort of evident to the system by a kind of like a blocking call or something, uh, then you can yield uh, you can yield the coroutine at one point and allow other coroutines to go and do useful work. Um, so as I say, if you're looking at a thread body, thinking this is going to take a long time, I wish I could go down here and do some work, um, then coroutines could be a good, you know, sort of a good way of doing that. Uh, the other nice thing is you get to implement your own dispatcher in Lua. Um, so this is quite a nice thing. And I think this is quite a nice exercise, really, to sort of really kind of bring home, uh, you know, kind of scheduling and how, how co-routines sort of all, you know, kind of work together. It's quite a fun thing to do. Um, so let's go through it. All right. So we've got uh, a sender co-routine in our behavior. We've got a receiver co-routine, a dispatcher, and we've got some main code. So let's step through these. So here's the sender coroutine, all right? And by the way, this is this is all of the code. Um, so I've not sort of cut it down or trimmed it. If you go and look at Lua chat, you'll be able to, you know, sort of see this for yourself. Um, but basically, okay, so we've got a while loop. Uh, and then the first thing it does here, which is quite interesting, is um, is it calls a, uh, well, it uses Lua POSIX. Uh, so um, if you go back and look at the build instructions, you'll see that we install them. Uh, sorry, it, when we get to the build instructions, you'll see that we're going to install uh, a Lua POSIX wrapper. Um, and what it does is it's polling on stood in, and it's doing that with a timeout. Uh, and the reason being is that if that was a blocking call, then uh, you would just sit there basically until the user types something, press enter. So messages that were being sent to you uh, wouldn't appear on the screen until you type something and press enter. All right, so uh, we're going to timeout after a second. Um, if uh, the return value is one, that means the user's typed something. Great, read it um, from the command line. Uh, sorry, read it from the uh, from the prompt. Um, it, providing that the message is not empty, we're going to send it. Uh, we're going to send it to the host uh, that we've passed in up here. Uh, it's given a port number, and here's our message. And then if everything's all good, we log a, a message and we end. Yeah. And then down here, we're going to yield the coroutine. So you know, let something else spin at this point. Here's the receiver, so similar idea. Uh, we're gonna sit here spinning, uh, yielding our co-routine until a message is available, um, at which point we're gonna call get next message. So actually get it from C++. Uh, uh, oh, and by the way, um, this little bit of syntax, uh, this basically is the way to invoke a um, C++ member function. Uh, and the reason for it is, you know, because that's, Passing in this is the first uh, first argument, basically. Uh, then we're going to print out an info message, and we're going to print it to the console. So we could see it. So if, for example, you wanted to change a prompt, uh, you could just, you know, uh, midway through a conversation, you could just control C your conversation, Vim your Lua, um, and then just, you know, uh, reconnect and carry on. And here's the dispatcher. So um, like I said, first thing we're going to do is create a timer. So again, this is a this is a in C plus uh, plus, and then we're going to spin around this loop. We're going to say uh, if we've got if we run out of coroutines to execute, then fine, break end. Uh, we will gracefully exit. Otherwise, we still got coroutines to run, so we're going to pull them out of our uh, coroutines table. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to resume that coroutine. And if it gives us a result, then it means that the coroutine is exited. Okay, uh, and if the type of the result is a string then it means we've got a runtime error. So we can print it as a critical uh, as a critical error. Otherwise, we can print a warning, um, and then uh, we just uh, zero it out of our coroutine table here because it's finished. OK. Timer down here has a blocking weight of a millisecond. Um, reason for that is because if you didn't have this, then this loop would just spin. You'd end up with a busy, busy weight loop, uh, and your CPU usage would go to 100%, and um, uh, people would get grumpy. Uh, so to this day, I still get uh, constantly bombarded by junk calls, despite having thought I turned the phone off. Uh, anyway, um, anyway, okay. So this uh, this this here is this is Maxint. Uh, this is a timer ID. It's an ID for the timer. The reason I'm using Maxint here is because I want to allow. Um, uh, uh, the users to use uh, timer IDs like zero, one, two, three, four, five, um, like this. So I put it right up at the top of the, the space so that it basically it's not going to conflict with user code. Okay. 
All right, excellent. All right, performance. What time is it? Uh, good. Okay. Um, so, all right. We've done it. Okay, so we've talked about sort of like lots of ways of combining C with Lua. So we talked about the Lua C API, we've talked about Sol3, we've talked about Swig. Um, so the question is, how do we measure these systems? How do we actually get some empirical kind of like information about how, how they perform, how they work, how do we make decisions about them? Um, so we're going to look at that in this section uh, now. So one good way is there's a, an excellent benchmark suite. So this has been provided by jean yves Manid uh, and uh, the Seoul community. Um, it's called the Lua Binding Shootout. And basically what it does is it takes 16 Lua bindings uh, and it wraps them all up into one nice repo. Um, and it allows you to, you know, with uh, Google Benchmark, um, uh, run some benchmarks. So I did that. Uh, I've run that for Sol3 and Swig um, uh, using, so again, these are, this is the latest for, latest releases of Sol3 and Swig, so 323 and 402, and also running it on the latest release of Lua, 542. Um, and I've done that for two architectures. So we're going to look at uh, an i5, um, x86. Uh, so uh, it's a laptop uh, about five years old and an embedded ARM V8. So it's actually one of the uh, train top units that we saw in the high-speed transport example. Um, and the reason that, you know, so I'm not trying to, I should point out, you know, this is not supposed to be about comparing um, the two architectures because that would probably be a bit meaningless. Um, but what I wanted to do really was to sort of uh, look at the trends and see if they exist across, across the two architectures, um, which is quite interesting. So the x86 is a 64-bit dual core. Um, it's got four threads, so it's got two virtual cores. It's uh, based on the Skylake microarchitecture. Um, it's 2.3 gigahertz. It's got an L1 of 128 kibibits, uh, and that's split evenly between uh, iCache and Dcache. So you've got 64 um, kibibits iCache, 64 kibibits uh, Dcache L1s, uh, 512 kibibits of L2, and uh, three mibibits of L3. So I've done this across Clang 9, 10, 11, um, just to sort of um, see what the difference in compiler uh, makes, uh, what, what difference the compiler makes. OK, this is what we get. Uh, so you can see there are actually quite a lot of these kind of Lua um, bindings out there, which is, you know, uh, hence my sort of previous comment at the beginning of the talk, where if you type into Google um, uh, Lua C binding uh, type thing, uh, you'll you'll get a bewildering array of stuff that's been around, or um, you know, sort of uh, uh, you know, um, there's a lot out there basically. So um, so, uh, however, if we look through our our code, let's just if we just turn off the clang ten and clang nine. Um, so the Lua C API, this is kind of seen as the sort of the gold standard, if you like. Um, uh, I mean, uh, as in you know, you can't you, any abstraction you're going to apply on top of that is going to add some cost. But we can see that Sol three is is you know is um, the fastest, uh, and the amount you know really I mean the amount of sort of cost that these benchmarks are adding I mean this is tiny given the amount of uh, you know benefits in terms of maintainability and code readability that Sol three is giving you, um, then you know why wouldn't you use it I mean it's really not costing you very much. Lura um, also very interesting uh, very good. Sol two, so you can see the sort of relative performance between uh, in performance improvement between Sol two and Sol three. Kaguya also another good one. Um, there's lots of swig down here, but bear in mind there's lots of ways of making this faster. Um, uh, uh, you know, and obviously that's giving you the ability to generate you know lots of bindings for different languages, um, but from one set of sources. So that is quite powerful. Um, if you look at if you look at it by compiler, uh, what you'll find actually what is a really very pleasing kind of like uh, progression. So Clang 10 is faster than Clang 9. Clang 11 is faster than Clang 10, which is what you'd expect, basically. But um, it's really beautiful to sort of see that. I mean, Clang is such a, a, a gift to the world. I mean, it really is. Um, but, it, you know, it, it really is, you know, just by compiling with a, a more recent compiler, you're just getting, uh, you know, just getting faster code. It's, it's really excellent. Uh, we look at this, if we zoom in on kind of the bits that were sort of a bit more interesting. So these are individual benchmarks. So these are six benchmarks that are supported across um, uh, the Lua C API, Sol2, Sol3, and Swig. So some of the benchmarks, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of benchmarks in the Lua binding shootout, uh, but some of them don't uh, aren't supported on every wrapper. 
Um, but if we look at the Lewis CAPR, we can kind of see that there's a sort of trend here. I mean, SOL2 obviously had this problem with implicit inheritance um, that, uh, you know, sort of been, been addressed in SOL3, so that's very good. Um, but, you know, there's kind of a, a sort of a pattern emerges. You can see the sort of Lewis CAPI in terms of cost is, um, you know, obviously the, the gold standard. Then SOL3 is kind of next. Uh, um, SOL2 and then SWIG is a bit more sort of up and downy over here. So uh, if we do this by on, on the arm, um, uh, then you kind of see a similar pattern, which is interesting. And that's really what I wanted to test was, um, could I sort of use uh, an X86 as a proxy for measuring stuff on the arm? I mean, and that's quite that's quite convenient. But of course, obviously, you can just run it on the arm anyway. So um, you know, it's uh, it's useful, but uh, it's nice to get some comparison. So again, we can sort of see that the Lewis C API it kind of looks like the best you know best in class, if you like, uh, followed by Sol three, Sol two. Still got this implicit inheritance issue, um, and then Swig. You know, uh, the average is a bit more kind of up and downy. And if we plot, if we just aggregate the benchmarks and just plot them, um, then that's what we can see. So CAPI is consistently the best. Sol three is consistently the second one. Uh, Sol two and Swig, you know, are, are sort of you know kind of following like that. So. Okay, so what that gives you really is, uh, you know, it's a kind of a, like I said, really what I wanted to do is sort of give some hints as to how you could potentially um, uh, start reasoning about these systems empirically, the sorts of things you could use, the sorts of uh, tools that are out there and stuff. So, um, uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's kind of one approach. All right, conclusion. So let's, let's talk about the conclusions. So a bit of advice on performance. Um, Sol3 is fast, but you can go faster, and we all want to go faster with, with this stuff. Um, so there's lots of good advice here. Uh, uh, I mean, you can obviously, you could because it's uh, really, you know, sort of very native C++, you can, um, you know, tune it as much as you, as much as you need and want to. Um, MCM, uh, when, when we looked at the SWIG route, it, it, you know, be careful with this, it, you know, when you're using SWIG, your code tends to spend a lot of time in the SWIG wrapper. So depending on what it's doing, um, uh, that's something to, to sort of bear in mind. Prefer, if you can, prefer lightweight type maps because what tends to happen in practice is this code gets written once, it gets kind of, it gets to a point where it works and then it's never sort of really touched again. Um, the partitioning between C++ and, and Lua is important. So try to get that broadly correct uh, from the start. Um, it, it's, it is quite fluid. You can move between, you know, move things between C++ and Lua, and we do that all the time. So code that we've wanted to make more, uh, you know, to speed up, we've moved into C++. Um, and code that we wanted to make more uh, flexible, we've moved into Lua. So as is the concurrency design. So bear that in mind. So, you know, what I would say with the concurrency design is, is try to keep it simple. Um, so, uh, it, you know, be clear about, you know, kind of what you what you want to do. And kind of with concurrency design as well, I found that the best strategy is um, what you want to try and avoid is being in a position where you end up with a race condition or something that's really tricky to debug. So like a race condition on a train that only happens once every three days or something like that, it's going to be really hard to debug. So the way to address that is when you're doing your concurrency design, design is to try and have in your mindset the, the thinking that I'm going to design out whole classes of bugs. Um, so I'm going to make sure that this cannot race with this because I've got this, this, this. And, you know, and, and really sort of approach it from that perspective. Um, a lot of code, concurrency code, if it grows organically, um, can end up, you know, with really sort of tricky bugs that are, you know, really difficult to sort of uh, try and debug in the field. So how do code interacts with Lua is significant. So yeah, if you can um, prefer pre-compiled long-lived behavior. So rather than jumping in and out of the Lua interpreter, um, if you can, you know, sort of have a, a Lua behavior where basically, you know, the system sort of starts up and then it, it sort of, it, you know, pretty well transfers control into the Lua behavior and the Lua behavior is doing all of the kind of work with, you know, sort of gently kind of prodding the C++. Um, the reason for that is you'll get much better cache performance. Uh, if you are, uh, what I find is if you're hopping between the, uh, hopping in and out of the Lua interpreter, that can be quite costly. 
Um, and it tends to have, you know, quite a detrimental effect on your iCache or Dcache or branch prediction. You know, all of that stuff just, you know, goes cold and, um, and you have to spin it up again. All right, so combination of C++ and Lua is powerful. Um, and as I say, if you've not kind of done this before, or if you haven't got this in your sort of programmer's toolkit, it's well worth a look. I would seriously, I, I really would uh, um, have, a, have a sit down with Sol3. Um, that container example would be, you know, sort of a, a good place to start. Um, we sort of introduced sort of actions written in C++ behaviors written in Lua. Uh, Sol3, which is great, it binds modern C++ to Lua. And as I say, those guys are very friendly and very kind of, um, up with modern C++ and really sort of pushing pushing on modern C++, so that's good. Simple to use, fast, um, but yeah, bear in mind, it, it's the C++ to Lua binding. Um, so possibly, maybe for production, have a think about SWIG. Um, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's proved to be very useful for us. Um, and as I say, being able to generate bindings in multiple target languages uh, uh, is has been very useful. Um, yeah, just watch the performance, especially in the Swig wrappers, but there's lots of things you can do to speed it up. So Lua 5.2 is now available. I think 5.3 is uh, imminent, um, so that's coming out soon. Also, here's a good um, reference. I don't think it gets enough kind of publicity. Um, the Lua quick reference, which was updated for Lua 5.4, is out there. Uh, I think for you guys, you're all sort of super savvy, you know, world-class programmers. You know, you don't need Hello World. Um, you know, go for this uh, is what I would do. Also, you know, uh, if you can, you maybe consider buying the programming in Lua book. It's very good um, and it supports the project. Uh, uh, and I've certainly found it very useful. The combination of that and the quick reference is probably all you'll ever need, basically. So, okay, well, thank you very much for coming. Um, so obviously I'm around for questions. I think probably, yeah, I've used quite a lot of time there. Um, here's my URLs and, and so forth. Um, so if anybody wants to ask anything, obviously I'll be at the tables or we can do it now. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, I will, um, yes, I, I will see you at the rest of the conference, basically. So uh, any questions? Uh, thank you, Costas. It, well, thank, thank you, Hemi. Thanks, Chris. Um, if you get, if you want any uh, help, Hemi, then uh, by all means, um, mail me. You, you know, very happy to sort of, uh, uh, you know, talk to you about this. Okay, I think I think we're I think we're done. Thank you very much.